Hello folks. So, in the last video we started to enter the world of occupation. And we understood the breakup of citizen or public into specific categories, combatant, uh, etc. So, it says that the next phase of that is the E. It says administration of occupied territory. Allegiance. The occupying power is forbidden to compel the inhabitants of occupied territory to swear allegiance to it. And that's governed by the manual of the law of armed conflict. It says administration. Occupying power assumes responsibility for administering the occupied area. Whether the administration is imposed by the occupying power is called a military government or civil government is not important. The legality of its acts will be determined in accordance with the law of armed conflict. The occupying power cannot circumvent its responsibilities by installing a puppet government or by issuing orders that are implemented through local government officials still operating in the territory. Well, that's clearly not operating in accordance with that because the stakeholder committee in each town has the council by the neck and basically through the incorporation of, of our domestic system and our services all the money and the profits are going into the private realm and the corporations or the stake through the stakeholder committee and all the liabilities for everything that this private realm does through its corporations is shoved on to the taxpayer because the council is involved. So that's that. That's not operating according to the rules of administration. So that that's another major breach that's going on uh, because we are living under stakeholder capitalism, and we have been for quite a number of years. And that needs to be understood. It's it's not capitalism per se. On the ground, as I said, it's stakeholder capitalism, but higher up in the stock markets, you've got casino capitalism, where it's costing the hedge funds and the big boys zero to borrow huge amounts of money to actually then buy up our infrastructure. You see? So it works for them, and you're getting pittance on your uh, savings in any bank. So that's, that's the way they're working. Yeah, stakeholder capitalism on the ground, a casino capitalism, or a casino economy, as it were, at the top end. So they're definitely in breach there, for sure. That's absolutely outrageous uh, that, that they can actually get away with that. That they can... They're not, they've actually installed a puppet government by issuing orders that are implemented through our local government officials or councillors. Yeah, county councillors. These are all people, these people have been co-opted. It says, Further, an occupying power is also responsible for ensuring respect for applicable human rights standards in the occupied territory. Now, we still, we are still a part of Europe. We haven't come out of Europe. So the European Convention on Human Rights still applies under occupation. Yeah, we have to keep our eyes on that because we're still in the European Union. Forget Brexit, forget everything they're saying. This is just a big talk. We're still there. That means that's still active and it has to be. Otherwise, we're dealing with just deception upon deception. Officials, civil servants, police and judges. Now, this might be interesting for you to, to, to see because it's just another... Um, body of information that shows how we are all in this. It doesn't matter whether you're a judge, you're a police officer, civil servant, whatever you may be, you're a judge. You're no different and no less trapped by this system than the man on the street. We are all trapped by this, and this will help you understand why that is so. Officials of the occupied territory owe no duty of allegiance to the occupying power and may refuse to serve that power. If they have fled, the occupying power will have to form its own administration. Local authority officials who remain may be employed for this purpose. Okay. Duties of officials. 
the occupying power may not alter the status of officials, nor apply any sanctions or take measures of coercion or discrimination against them if they decide to abstain on grounds of conscience from fulfilling their functions. Now, that that's been broke as well, because the coercion is you do your job or you do job. That is coercion, is it not? Uh, coerced, coerced to lie to the public by pretending they are holding an office of state when in fact what they're doing is doing exactly what they're told by the stakeholder committee. So they have therefore altered the status of officials from de jure, as we would expect them to be, representing us as a body of councillors, but are actually acting in the capacity of de facto. So they're pretending to be something they're not and then keeping that from you, the public. So that's a definite shift in the uh, status of officials made so by the occupying force or, in this case, the stakeholder committee, which is a part of the occupying force. The intention is to get MERS in and then it's the MERS dealing directly with the United Nations Security Council, bypassing all other avenues of nation and state that we set up. Not the corporate state that said, no, but what this is usurped. That should be in power, not this. Um, but, okay, a belligerent cannot compel officials to take part in military operations against their own country even if they were in the belligerent service before the commencement of the armed conflict. Those who refuse to serve may nevertheless be compelled to do certain types of work, and then you have to look at paragraph 1152.44 of the Manual of Global Conflict. We're not going to go into that kind of detail here, because right now all we need to do is get it in your minds that it would appear absolutely certain that we are all operating under these rules. Twisted and tweaked or encouraged, if we use their own terminology, by the United Nations Security Council, which, as we all know, is run by the office or CEO of the United, the Corporation of the United States of America. So, therefore, today we would put Trump in that position, who's just basically took over the Fed. And he's now probably the most powerful president that's maybe ever been. And could be a good thing if you go for this fact, the idea, this bit of a fantasy that Hillary and all these people are going to be bound on. Oh, it's not happening, is it? We've said before, Hillary is married to Bill. Bill's got a seat on the committee of 300. There's nothing going to happen to Hillary. Hillary's also Donald Trump's cousin. Now, unless he's a really naughty boy. I can't see anything of the sort really taking place, but as long as they can convince you that it's happening, you stand down, nothing needs to be done. The consequence of no declaration of war, because declarations of war give the opposing fi uh, side the option to mobilise. When there is no declaration of war, there is no mobilisation against the invasion operation. Officials will normally be given instructions by their own government whether or not to remain at their posts in the event of occupation. In the absence of instructions, each must use his initiative. In making their decisions, officials must consider the need to protect life and property. The police should, so far as possible, continue their functions so as to avoid a complete breakdown of law and order. However, they cannot be required to act against lawful combatants, including properly organised resistance movements. That's interesting. That's very interesting. So, how would immigration as do? How would they be seen as a resistance movement? Is that why the, the police tend to uh, count out to certain factions? That might need to be considered also. Um, continu continuity of local administration is important if chaos is to be prevented and the welfare of the population sustained. So they do use quite a few words to describe us people, population, inhabitants, belligerents, combatants, etc. That's quite a lot of divisions of 
person. Dismissal of officials. The occupying power may dismiss officials, including judges, and replace them if they refuse to obedience to the occupying power. Now, can you see what I'm saying here? How judges are trapped the same as everybody else. So this is why we don't want to be divided amongst ourselves and our own system. It's the takeover of our systems that's malfunctioning in relation to giving us the services that we expect that we've set up. Yet something other than is now in control of that and it's taking its lead from the rules of occupation. However, this power should not be used arbitrarily, for example, for reasons unconnected with the official's work or because the officials refuse to carry out an order that is contrary to international law. So this is where you can still use the jurisdiction of man because under the rules of occupation you're not allowed to remove the public's access to the existing law. This isn't law, this is commercial policy and maritime. That's what it is. So it's full on military if you're in this. This is person. This is why we have to understand to shift out of that into the world of man and law. Because you were not going to get anywhere under this. Straight away you're going to be a belligerent. You're going to be, a, you know, it's just goes on and on. They're just going to categorise you. Bang, that's what you're going to get with you. You enter Admiralty Court as a defendant. Okay, this is where you need to start working your brain a little bit. To, to rectify this, you need to shift out of everything you've learnt. Don't take anything away from yourself. You've worked hard and it's never lost what we do achieve. But when... We're at this point now, you really do have to shift out of this in order to move in it by, uh, with some, you know, the protection that our law, which we have by right, is still in place. We have to, we have to, uh, we have to give it life by using it. Retention of officials. The occupying power is responsible for paying the salaries of officials who continue to serve if it collects the taxes of the occupied territory. Now here you see your council tax. Yeah? So they're profiting from the occupation, even though it's forbidden. We haven't got to that kind of stuff yet. That might be in the next video. Officials may, as a condition of their being permitted to continue in office, be called upon to take an oath or give an assurance that they will perform their duties conscientiously. The occupying power has no right to demand an oath of allegiance. Mm, that's a bit... Uh, so the, the occupation, basically, once it's set up, has one job, and that is to get as many of the population to consent and then join it by their own will. Now, that's very clever. So that you can see now how Germany was dividing. In comes the corporate realm offering all the prizes at a time when you're flat on your ass, as the Germans were from the reparations. And you, you, it's carrots, you know, carrots thing, the all weapons, it's all this, all that, you know, power. Can you see how it drags you? It drags you into it on your own uh, will, which it's forbidden to, to make you. But, you know, it's quite a, 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 a carrot when it comes on the back of well, if you don't go along with it, you've lost all your money and you're out there with the unwashed. And especially when they're looking at starvation, etc. Who in the right mind is going to forsake their salary in these kind of times? That is... So it's very clever, but this is extremely wizardry. So we know what priesthood this is coming from. This is Kabbalah. This, this is just full-on deception. But, as again, it's all about gaining your support for this as sovereign by your own consent, by your own will. That's the clever bit, you know? But it's also the sinister part of it as well. Offences by officials. Wrongful acts by officials may lead to their dismissal. Where their acts constitute ordinary crimes, they must be tried and punished according to the laws of the occupied territory. Any act calculated to injure the occupying forces may be dealt with according to security laws previously introduced by the occupying power. Interment may also be ordered in the interest of the security of the occupying power. 
Okay, now that's that's when it starts to get dangerous. So that's when you start to get your concentration camps coming together. So you can see that this, it, we can see where this comes from. Because you can see what it serves. And it's been wrapped up in all sorts of rights and liberties, etc. over these decades. But when it comes down to it, it's so double-edged, this, it's quite frightening. You cannot win if you're in that as a person. Do you understand? Because that is your yoke as a person. The law. The law in force. There is an obligation during the occupation to respect the laws in force in the occupied territory unless absolutely prevented. Can you see that? An occupying power would be prevented from respecting the laws in force if they conflicted with its obligations under international law, especially Geneva Convention for 1949. We're going to have to look at that at some point. The occupying power is not obliged to use the full powers available under the laws in force in occupied territory. It may suspend any of those laws. But again, we're dealing with person. So though they, they call it law, they're still speaking in terms of admiralty. So it's person. You are on the dead trust still if you are in this person. So this is all dealing with dead trusts. Now, we lost the crown to deal with and collect all the lost souls, dead souls, in 1975. We took it off Spain in, I think, 1604, when it was given to King James I after the unification of the two crowns. So the Vatican or Rome gave the the right to uh, collect all these lost souls to England under James I. And we lost that in 1975, and it went back to Spain and to King Juan Carlos of Spain, who was, of course, the King of Jerusalem. Oh, you're seeing this now. So Spain now is, in fact, the Roman licensed collector of dead trusts, dead souls. Keep that in mind, people. The occupying power is not obliged to use the full powers available under the laws in force in occupied territory. It may suspend any of those laws that affect its own security. For example, those concerning conscription, electoral enfranchisement, rights of public assembly, the bearing of arms and the freedom of the press. Hmm. So there are examples of laws that it can actually... Alter. So we've got rid of the freedom of the press because that's now owned. I think is it ninety six percent is owned by um, a very small number of people claiming to be of the Noahide. So they've certainly uh, changed the freedom of the press, and that was done a long time ago. Because of course we've been under occupation for quite a long time, as we've explored in the previous videos. The right of the inhabitants to take legal action in the local courts must not be affected. The occupying power may be armed, sorry, may amend the existing law of the occupied territory or promulgate a new law if this is necessitated by the exigencies of armed conflict, the maintenance of order or the welfare of the population. So you can see where this COVID shit, this pandemic garbage is playing into their claim of welfare of the population. So they're basically claiming now to be completely in control of your welfare outside of your own rights to your own welfare. And this again, and you need to be reminded, is against person. Yeah? You don't want to be person. You want to be a man or a woman. The domestic law of the occupying power, apart from that affecting its own armed forces does not extend to occupied territory. So the, the domestic law of the occupying power doesn't transfer to the occupied territory, which is for whether they're operating under the, the Geneva Convention and this um, this occupation format. So that, that's something to know. They can't transfer it. Now, that's interesting because if we look at the caliphate and that the way that operates, that is actually breaking this law if, if we're dealing with occupation because it's trying to transfer the domestic law of its own place of origin onto other nations so that's worth looking at as well and considering um 
Because that in itself could put these Muslims in some serious problems when this turns, which is the intention is for one day for it to turn against them. That's the setup. That's the trap. Um, since the occupying power has a duty to look after the welfare of the inhabitants, regulations, for example, fixing prices and securing the equitable distribution of food and other commodities are permissible, the occupying power should make no more changes to the law than are absolutely necessary, particularly where the occupied territory already has an adequate legal system. Well, the West has the supreme legal system, because that's the bloody origin of the garbage. Well, probably not. I'm looking at Babylon, but never mind. Uh, jurisdiction. The courts of occupied territory retain jurisdiction to deal with any of the inhabitants' cases that are neither of a military nature nor affect the safety of the occupying forces. Jurisdiction in the latter two cases is a matter for the authorities of the occupying power. Members of the occupying forces and their civilian component are normally not subject to the jurisdictions of the local courts, but remain under that of their own military authorities. Right, so anybody, ah, so people that come in that are part of this occupying force are not subject to, ah, that's an interesting point as well. Because now we can start to determine who are classed in this format as a civilian component to this occupying force. Because there's a lot of protections going up at the moment about racism, um, supremacy, all this shit, this nonsense. Um, and it's being thrown up by uh, what are, uh, by nature, foreigners to this country. So are they being brought in as, as, as civilian components to this occupation? Mm, the immigration system and agenda is coming under the United Nations, So and Agenda 2130 now. So maybe we're starting to see why they're getting a bit of a free reign, uh, with the behaviour that's not conducive to the keeping of the peace in this country, upon which our entire uh, system of law, the nine principles of law, is based. Uh, so again, you know, this occupying force isn't acting correctly. It's um, it's not abiding by the rules here. But of course, remember, the United Nations Security Council can encourage the changes of law. In against person. Person. It's so important. Local courts. The local courts may be suspended only if necessitated by the judges or magistrates refusal to act or on account of the behaviour of the inhabitants. Now I had a friend who actually had Burnley Court shut down completely because he was establishing the standing in the Admiralty Court and was refusing to allow the prosecutor to gain the position in the trust of beneficiary. Uh, and from that, they shut the whole courts down and emptied the courts, and they didn't reopen again that day. Um, so they are protecting this knowledge, if you show it, that you know how to retain your position in, your, in the trust as beneficiary. Keep that in mind as well. You know, you, you've not just got owing up against the lingo and the, the wizardry. They will come down on you like a ton of bricks if you start to express that in the Admiralty Courts. Which is why, again, I'm trying to say, get out of there. Get out of person. Get back into biblical man, woman. Publication of measures. The suspension, modification or replacement of law or courts must be published to the population of the occupied territory in their own language. So if there are changes, modifications... Now, that's interesting. That That is very interesting because there's been so many changes to a, our courts, um, to installing code over policy, over law... And they do publish it, but people don't understand that that's what's actually happening. It's, it's being telegraphed, but you're not understanding it as a telegraph. It's just noise on the news. Criminal law. The special rules of the Convention dealing with the administration of criminal law in occupied territory are dealt with in paragraphs 1156 to 11.74. Occupation costs. The economy of an occupied country can only be required to bear the expenses of the occupation and these should not be greater than the economy of the country can reasonably be expected to bear. 
Well, they've just bailed us out how many times since 2000? Till 2008. How many times have they bailed themselves out and made us pay for it? See, that's solely to keep the banks alive. Well, this is a banking occupation through the United Nations. That's what it is. So we're not just burning the expenses, we're burning the, the costs of the banks, the private. That's in breach of occupational costs. It <laughs> Taxation. If the occupying power collects taxes, duties and tolls which are payable in the occupied state, it's bound to apply them towards the cost of administering that territory. Council tax. VAT. It's why you don't get any services. Income tax is only payable when you are in a state of war. Have you forgot this? Income tax is a tax levied when you're at war. Do you understand what I'm saying there? If you're paying tax now to this, you are in breach. You are in treason, which invokes Magna Carta 64, 61, Article 61. To lawful rebellion in not taking part in the system, not paying taxes, etc. That is our remedy in relation to undermining this clear breach of the occupation costs. Yeah, they've changed everything as a direct result of the occupation, which is forbidden in these this body of, of policy governing occupation. As far as possible, it must do so in accordance with the existing local tax laws, but any balance may be applied towards the maintenance of occupying forces. However, local rates may only be used for the purposes for which they were levied. Well, we're not getting any services back, are we? The roads are in a right mess. I've just watched them in my town this week make an absolute disastrous mess. About 20 men. Lancashire County Council, wagons, everything going on. What a mess. It's like primary school kids have done it with putty. Yeah, so however, local rates may only be used for purposes which were levied. If tax officials continue to work normally, taxes will be collected by them in the usual way. Otherwise, the occupying power may impose an obligation on each local authority to collect and pay a proportion of total revenue. And this is being done again, as I've said, by the stakeholder committee, who has the council, the body of council, is by the neck. The occupying power can levy contributions from the inhabitants which may only be applied to the needs of the occupying forces or to the administration of the territory and only so far as those requirements are not met by existing taxation. Well, this is your literums. They're ta fining you now. You see, the way that they're gathering revenue from you is to fine you. Yeah? Well, we're already paid for the litter to be picked up by the councils in taxation. The council tax covers it. Income tax covers it. You know, this is the way it is. We pay for the roads to be kept up. So... Again, funds must funds raised must not be used for the enrichment of the occupying power or its personnel, nor be used as a collective punishment. Well, damn right, that's a collective punishment, being fined for dropping litter on the streets you've already paid for the council to do in taxation. Breach again of the occupying rules. Commerce. The occupying power may place on the occupied territory such restrictions and conditions in respect of commercial dealings as may be necessary for military purposes. For the same reasons, it may remove existing restrictions such as current customs tariffs. Currency. The occupying power's own currency may be used in addition to that of the occupied territory. Currency regulations may be issued by the occupying power. These measures must be necessitated by the situation in the occupied territory and must not be for the purpose of enriching the occupying power or damaging the local economy. That They've been shutting our shops in the town centre for how long? They've raised massive taxes. They stop people shopping. They're in breach. Again, it follows that attempts to debase the currency or impose artificial exchange rates would be unlawful. You've seen this? The breach in all this. These measures must be necessitated by the situation in the occupied territory and must not be for the purpose of enriching the occupying power or damaging the local economy. Did you see that? They've obliterated the local economy. They're doing it again now with the lockdown. The lockdown is damaging enterprise, private enterprise by you and me out there. That's what they're doing. It follows the attempts 
to debase the currency or, or impose artificial exchange rates would be unlawful. The occupying power may also issue vouchers for use by members of its forces and civilian components in the occupying forces installations, shops and canteens. So there we go again, the civilian component to the occupation. So that's basically those that have willingly joined it and give it sovereignty over their own nation. And I don't think people realise that they're actually that that's actually what you've actually done. There's plenty of grammar there for you to absorb again. But things are certainly not right. But when you look at this format, you can see that this is actually what's playing out around us all today. Occupation. So we really need to start to pull together and work out how we use our systems that we have in place in law, which we are, um, to remain in connection with, even under occupation, and start to cease this nonsense um, and cease it forthwith, because uh, I would suggest something other than the pound sterling is now being issued by the Bank of England and that's a strange situation altogether and does um, breach the rules on currency and they certainly damage the local economy. So, until the next time.